Is his love is like the mighty ocean? His love for me will never stop. Oh, his arms are strong enough to carry me through it all by the grace of God. You are with us, Jesus, you are with us, Jesus, you are with us, walking by side, walking by side, and I receive your love today, I receive your love.
sessions of gas street are beginning to pray. Just let their prayers rumble along. And when you begin to join in the prayer, that we'd see God move in our streets, in our neighborhoods, that we'd see God awaken. Wonder for his name at this time in our nation. Come on. Open up the door. Andrews Church Online. Now whether you're joining us from uh, High Wycombe uh, near St Andrews uh, Handels Lane where we're based or whether you are further afield in the UK or even overseas it's wonderful to welcome you and particularly if you're here for the first time or you're new to all this and if you are we have something special today which is going to be after this online service particularly when it goes live um, later on at about 11 o'clock, 11.15, whenever we finish, called a Newcomers Zoom. And we'll tell you more details about how you can engage with that and enjoy that later on. Yeah, that'll be great. Looking forward to meeting you on, on that later. So during our service this morning, we're going to be hearing later on from Henrietta Blythe, who is um, CEO of Open Doors. It was great to have Henrietta speak at a women's breakfast a few months ago at St Andrews. And we really um, appreciated what she had to say. She had some great stories to tell us. So we're looking forward to hearing what she has to say today. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure it would be challenging, but it would be great for us to know how we can support Christians in um, situations around the world where they're being persecuted and hit even harder by COVID-19 than we are here. So as we go on through our service today, we're going to be having communion. So do get something ready that you can um, join in with us, get something you can uh, drink and something you can eat. So maybe some wine and some bread or some juice and a biscuit or whatever it is that you'd like to join in in taking communion this morning. Mm. We'll be hearing some news, updates of things that are happening and also some stories. So we hope you meet with God today in this service. And as we begin, we're going to do something a bit different in terms of the song we've got. It's going to be sung by Beth, uh, and it's a song some of you will know, some won't, by Lauren Daigle. And uh, it's, it's called You Say, and it's picking up on who God says we are, that even though we might feel weak, He is strong. Mm -hmm. And it's a great preparation for communion as we have this in a moment.
Father, we thank you that you know who you say we are. And Lord God, we just ask you today to open our hearts and minds to hear more of who you're saying we are and the things that you call us to. We just say, come Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we wanted to uh, say a big thank you to some people. Thank you to those of you who have volunteered to join our gardening team to help to look after the, the church uh, grounds during this time uh, when others are unable to do that so there's a picture of them thank you you guys and a big thank you also to uh, Bob who's been uh, volunteering in that way and cutting the grass and things during this time of lockdown when the grass goes on growing and uh, you may have heard that this coming week churches are now uh, allowed to open for private prayer and uh, what we are organizing is that this coming week we're going to open up the church for an hour of supervised prayer where we're going to invite not just the local church members yourselves who are watching but anyone in our community we'd love to invite them uh, for reflection maybe to work through some of the things that they are grappling with at this time and just a chance to come before God so we're going to have that from 12 to 1 Monday to Friday and uh, we particularly need help for anyone who can be a volunteer at that time, whether it's for half an hour or for an hour between that time, any of those days, if you could email the church office and say, I'd love to help just to enable that to happen. We don't know what the response will be, but we want to give it a try. We're going to move on now and take communion together. So before we do that, let's have a, a few moments when we're able, individually, each of us, just to ask God to uh, prepare our hearts and our minds so that we're ready to, to take communion together. So you might want to take a few minutes now and just think, you know, Lord God, we ask you to search us, to show us, is there anything in our hearts and our minds that we need to put right with you now? Just lead us and show us what those things are. So 
as we think about what we're going to do taking this bread and wine, let's remind ourselves what Scripture teaches us, which says this. It says, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For, when, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And let's pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. The words will be on the screen for us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Let's say together, though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. So the invitation is to you to come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you're weak. And come not because any goodness of your own gives you the right to come, but because you need mercy and help. We're now going to share in this bread and wine and maybe you want to do that either on your own if that's where you are or with somebody else using whatever you have. So we're just going to do that now. Debbie, the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. So I'm in the body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you, Debbie. Amen. And the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. Well, it's good that we can share in communion together, wherever we are in our homes. And um, what we're going to do now is to pray and bring the needs that we have, that the church faces, that the world faces at this time. And as we look forward also to hearing about the persecuted church, we also want to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are at this time facing real difficulties. So uh, we want to pray now together. Let's do that. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you are Lord of all the earth. You are Emmanuel, God with us. You are the Prince of Peace, our fortress, our helper, our deliverer. We worship you for who you are. We lift your name up this morning. May your name be kept holy on our lips. May you come and take your rightful place as Lord over our lives. May we be God-fearing people and a light to a dark world. Father God, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you that as lockdown has eased, that we are able to begin reuniting with loved ones. Thank you that we can see friends again in parks, for shops and businesses that will begin to reopen, and for kids who are slowly returning to school. We give you thanks for our NHS and for the sacrifices they have made to keep us safe. Lord, we thank you for watching over us in this uncertain time. And although it has caused turbulence in our lives, you have main, remained the rock on which we stand. Father God, give, a, give our Prime Minister wisdom to know the right steps in moving forward. Give us peace as we leave our homes of safety and help us to have courage to face normal life again. 
we lift up those who may be anxious of change and of the unknown Lord. We ask for comfort and a steady hand to guide them. We turn now to think of our persecuted of the persecuted church as Henrietta brings a message to us this morning. Help us to be open and willing to learn. God, we lift up our brothers and sisters to you in our prayers and ask you would strengthen them. Thank you that you promised your Holy Spirit to us in times of trial. We ask, Lord, that you would strengthen our brothers and sisters, strengthen their hearts, give them your words, give them peace which surpasses all understanding. Use all they do for your glory, Lord. Help us to learn from their bravery and be bold in our faith towards others. Lord, we lift up to you this Black Lives Matter movement. Lord, we know that we live in an unjust world where racism does happen and happens in a place where we may not notice. Lord, we pray for those who have long awaited this time and have prayed for an end to their suffering. We ask, Lord, that their voices would be heard. Help us to comfort those who mourn. Give us compassion towards those who suffered, who have suffered. Help us to hear their cry and allow them space to mourn. We pray for those who, in their anger, have turned to violence. Lord, we ask for their forgiveness. Help us not to retaliate by hardening our hearts. We ask that you'd give us wisdom in knowing how to pray and respond in love. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So thank you, Annie, for uh, those prayers. We wanted to uh, draw your attention to a few things that are happening over the next few weeks. And uh, one of those things is starting this week on Wednesday. So this Wednesday, we have our first online marriage course starting. And this is um, a great opportunity for you. You know, you may feel there are many other things that you can't do at this time. You may have more time available. Or you may not, but, but it's the ease of which you can do this in your own homes. So set aside some time to, uh, to do this course. It's a great course and an opportunity to, to talk to uh, your partner and to be able to really put into your marriage and make it stronger as you move forward together. And just uh, a couple of things over the next few weeks. Next Sunday is Father's Day. Uh, do join us for that. And then the following week on Sunday the 28th of June, we're joining with churches across High Wycombe for Love Wickham online. Uh, we are really looking forward to that. And um, you can be involved if you'd like to with the uh, worship and singing. They're forming a choir. And uh, I think anybody is allowed to join that and you could send in uh, your own uh, contribution towards a song which will uh, join as a, a choir when that's put together. So uh, do send in. If you haven't had the email about that, you can uh, email the church office to find out how you can get involved. So you'll be joining, Simon? Yeah, that'll definitely be my thing. <laughs> Not. <laughs> and uh, just in a moment, Bryn is going to do uh, a reading from the Bible for us. And Henrietta Blythe, who's from uh, Open Doors, the CEO of Open Doors, is going to speak to us. We're really looking forward to what Henrietta has to say. She's an inspiring speaker. And um, I'm sure that what she's going to be saying is going to be challenging to us in how we can be... Um, supporting uh, persecuted Christians around the world at, at this time. Today's reading is taken from Luke chapter 4. Jesus is tested in the wilderness. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem 
and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Hello, my name's Henrietta Blythe. I'm the Chief Executive of Open Doors UK and Ireland, and it's a very great pleasure to be with you all today. Imagine you wanted to destroy the global church. How would you go about it? Just think about that for a minute. If you wanted to eradicate Christianity completely from the face of the planet, how would you do it? You might decide to imprison and torture all the Christians. That's what's going on in North Korea and has been for the last 18 years. North Korea remains, according to Open Doors research, the most dangerous country in the world for Christians. Or you might decide to go after the church leaders and close all the churches. That's what's been increasingly happening in China over the last couple of years. Or you might decide to burn down all the churches destroy all the Bibles, drive out all the Christians and use the statues and other Christian artefacts for shooting practice. That's what Daesh, or so-called Islamic State, tried to do in Syria. Of course, you might also assume that the fear of these actions would be sufficient to intimidate people so much and put them in fear of their own lives and the lives of their loved ones that they would not practice Christianity anymore. After all, fear is an extremely powerful deterrent. Or you might big up the dominant religion in the country so that it became incredibly shameful for anyone to convert to Christianity. Then people's own families would turn against them. That's what we're seeing in countries like India and Bangladesh, so-called secular states where actually Hindu extremists and Muslims who are vastly in the majority in Bangladesh are so ashamed when a member of their family converts to Christianity, that they ostracize them, they drive them out of the house, they even on occasion try to kill them. Of course, you could also take a more tactical approach and just try to attack Christians at their weakest and most vulnerable and hit them when it's going to hurt them the most. Open Doors research shows that 260 million Christians around the world experience high or extreme levels of opposition and persecution. That means that approximately one in eight of our brothers and sisters around the world are either experiencing persecution or living in fear of it. In the passage we heard today from Luke 4, the devil was trying to destroy Jesus's faith and he was choosing to attack him at the moment when he considered he would be at his most vulnerable. My father for many years was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and they had this word, halt, Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Those are the moments you're likely to be at your most vulnerable. And therefore, those are the moments when you're most likely to be tempted to take a drink. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Halt. In this passage, Luke 
makes the point that Jesus was hungry. He'd been fasting for 40 days. He'd been in the desert on his own. He was isolated and lonely, and no doubt he was also very tired. I don't know about you, but any time I fast or do without food, I am absolutely exhausted. And I reckon Jesus must have been very tired in the desert as well. And it's at this moment when the devil chooses to attack him. Many persecutors do exactly the same thing. Take, for example, India. India is number 10 on the Open Doors World Watch List of the 50 most dangerous countries to be a Christian. In India, the powers that be have equated being a true Indian with being a Hindu, and they're therefore trying to eradicate all other, other religions, including Christianity and, Muslim, and Islam, from the country. So Hindu extremists are driving Christians out of their villages, they're refusing them jobs, they're denying them access to education, they are abducting pastors, wives and daughters and subjecting them to sexual assault. In the recent COVID-19 lockdowns in India, the Hindu extremists have seen another opportunity to kick Christians while they're down. In India, we know that maybe up to 70% of Christians are Dalits or untouchables. That means they earn a daily wage. They tend to be labourers, rickshaw drivers, cleaners. With the lockdown, they were unable to leave the house and therefore unable to work. No work meant no money, which meant no food. Although the government has provided some food aid, Christians are discriminated against in the distribution of that food aid. And the church in India has literally been in danger of starving to death. There's been a knock-on effect for church leaders who count on the weekly collection plate to get their income. If their parishioners have no money, neither do the church leaders, and they too have been facing starvation. I heard of a story recently of a couple who Open Doors partners managed to reach with food and rations. They had really wondered about whether or not they were going to get to this particular family. It was the end of the day, it was approaching the beginning of curfew, they just weren't sure. They were worried that the car might draw attention to these Christians in their local neighbourhood. But they really felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to push through and to get there. When they arrived, they found the pastor and his wife standing outside the door of the house. The children were in the house behind them and the pastor and his wife were standing there praying. And they said, when the team arrived, they said, we were standing here saying, Lord, we have nothing. We have nothing to feed our children with. We have absolutely nothing. Help us, please help us. And at that moment, the team had arrived. So far, Open Doors has managed to reach 20,000 Christians in India with food aid and basic supplies and we hope to reach 50,000 more. We hear the same story of discrimination from other countries. So Christians are hungry, they're stuck at home, they can't earn money. In northern Nigeria we hear that Muslims are being given six times as much food aid as Christians and in Vietnam we heard a story that in the north of Vietnam, 120 Christians were being denied food by the local authorities who told them, you are Christians and God will take care of your families. The government is not responsible for your families. 
We've also heard stories of religious extremists bribing Christians and saying if they will renounce their faith, then they will give them money so they can go and buy food for themselves and for their families. The truth is that whereas God is the ultimate creator and is always doing something new, the devil is not. He has no new tricks up his sleeve. He uses the same tactics now as he used in the Garden of Eden and as he used on Jesus in the desert. And this is his first one, to attack us, to attack our brothers and sisters when we are physically at our weakest, when we are hungry, angry, lonely, tired. The second tactic he uses, and again we see him using it here with Jesus, is to sow seeds of doubt that destroy our faith. Here he says to Jesus, not once, but twice, if you are the son of God. He pushes Jesus to make him doubt his God-given identity. He says, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. If you are the son of God, prove it by throwing yourself off the temple and God will look after you. The devil repeatedly challenges Jesus' faith and understanding of who he is, his God-given identity, and of who God is. Jesus is on his own in the desert. He was completely isolated and there was nobody to reaffirm his faith and identity in God. My friend Mudge was imprisoned in Iran for becoming a Christian. And he was kept in solitary confinement for a month in a room that was two meters wide by six meters long and just had a pillow and a blanket. He had nobody to talk to, no telephone, no online resources. It rather puts our lockdown, our lockdown experience into perspective doesn't it? While he was in solitary confinement, Mudge told me that it wasn't possible to think in a positive way. It was like his thoughts became chains around him. He said that he had tortured himself with questions. Does God really love me? Has God really accepted me? Am I really a child of God? Am I going to heaven? This is just a classic tactic of the enemies. He gets us on our own, he gets us isolated, and then he fills us with doubt. In the end, Mudge cried out to the Lord, and without knowing he was doing so, he actually used Jesus's words. He said, Lord, Lord, why have you forsaken me? And he told me that the Lord gave him a vision. This was a vision of a group of transparent, happy, joyful people. There was no pride, there was no jealousy. They were having a wonderful time together. Mudge told me that the, the feeling he had when he saw this group was just amazing. And in the midst of the group was Jesus. And Jesus looked straight out of the group at Mudge. And he said to them, you belong to this. You are my child. You belong to these people. Mudge said this became all of his energy. It filled him with renewed hope and renewed faith. And that day they actually took him for interrogation. And he said that as he lay on the table for interrogation, he was still smiling and at peace. The third tactic the devil uses in the passage in Luke is to bribe Jesus and to try to force him to worship him rather than God. This is an absolutely classic tactic of persecutors who want to eradicate Christianity. Many of you will have heard about Leah Sharibu, 
who is a teenage girl in northern Nigeria. Two years ago, she was abducted by Boko Haram with a hundred of her schoolmates. After some weeks, they were told they could go if they were prepared to renounce their Christianity and return to Islam. Leah was the only one not prepared to do that. She absolutely refused to give up her faith in Jesus. As a result, she is still being held and Boko Haram have said they will make her a slave for life. It's so common, this tactic of the enemies to say, I will give you all this if you will only worship me. So three key tactics used by the devil here are so common amongst persecutors who want to destroy the church. They want to hit us where we're physically and mentally at our most vulnerable. They want to isolate us and challenge our faith and our understanding of our God-given identity. And they want to force us to worship other gods and to renounce our belief in Jesus. Now you'll notice in this passage that the way Jesus stands strong against all these attacks is by quoting the Bible. We know that the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And the Bible is an immensely powerful weapon against persecution and opposition. Many of our persecuted brothers and sisters learn huge parts of the Bible off by heart. So they have it on their hearts and minds when they need it. And that, of, why, of course, is why people who want to destroy Christianity try to remove any access to the Bibles that Christians may have. Indeed, the whole Open Doors ministry was started by Brother Andrew, who felt called by the Lord in the 1960s to smuggle Bibles behind the Iron Curtain to reach Christians who were in Eastern Europe at the time and weren't able to worship freely. To this day, as a ministry, we smuggle Bibles. I can't tell you how we do it, but we're still doing it in some countries. And when governments and religious extremists want to destroy Christianity, the Bible is often the thing they go for. In China, back in 2018, when they changed the religious um, regulations, they also made it impossible to purchase a Bible online. So they're trying to squeeze people's access to the word of God. And so you would expect, wouldn't you, that these three tactics of the devils, coupled with the removal of the Bible, would surely be enough to destroy Christianity and wipe it off the face of the globe. But hang on a minute. If you look back at that passage in Luke, you will see that it was actually the Holy Spirit who led Jesus into the desert to be tempted by the devil. It was not the devil himself who led Jesus into the desert. It was the Holy Spirit. Now, why would the Holy Spirit do that? I think the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the desert to be tempted in that way because God knows that opposition and persecution, far from destroying our faith, actually strengthen our faith and our resolve to follow him. Far from destroying the church, the fires of persecution and opposition actually prove it and make it stronger and more resilient. 
the early church really recognised that. In the Acts of the Apostles, we read so many stories of how those first Christians were persecuted, killed, imprisoned, tested for their faith. And yet the Apostle Peter wrote to them and said, These trials have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. I was amazed to discover the truth of this when I joined Open Doors as CEO two years ago. Far from destroying the church, persecution actually strengthens it and helps the church to grow. It's completely counterintuitive, isn't it? But it's the truth. One of the things that happens is not only do we as Christians need to make a very definite and intentional choice to follow Jesus or not, we have to decide, is he worth it? And one of the extraordinary things is that we know he is. So our faith is strengthened, but not only that, the way we respond to the persecution is an amazing witness to others. A couple of years ago, I traveled to Egypt to meet some of our persecuted church family there. One of the things I learned was that the church had been praying for many years for change in Egypt. And when the Arab Spring happened, they were absolutely delighted. And then, of course, they were completely horrified when the Muslim Brotherhood came to power. One of my brothers there said to me, I never thought in my lifetime I would see the Muslim Brotherhood marching under my balcony in Cairo, shouting, Egypt is an Islamic nation. But during the two years that the Muslim Brotherhood were in power, Muslims across Egypt saw what radical Islam really looks like. They saw what the Muslim Brotherhood and so-called Islamic State were doing to Christians. And they saw the way Christians did not retaliate. They saw the way Christians even prayed for their persecutors. And they started to ask questions. They started to ask, is this really the faith I signed up for? And why are Christians responding like this? Thousands of them came to believe in Jesus. We visited a church in Cairo, this was a couple of years ago, that had already baptised 6,000 Muslim background believers since the Arab Spring. So far from destroying the church, persecution actually proves our faith and helps the church to grow. But our brothers and sisters need our help to stand strong. We know that risk is always a product of both hazard and vulnerability. There's not so much we can do about the hazard of persecution, although we do indeed campaign at Open Doors for freedom of religion or belief, which is actually Article 18 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. But there is a great deal that we can do to reduce the vulnerability of our persecuted church family. We can help them stand strong by giving them food and other basic supplies when they're at risk of starving, as they are at the moment. We can help them know that they are not alone. We can reduce their isolation and reaffirm for them the truth that they are God's children. We are all part of God's family and we stand with them. We can pray for them that they will not be led into temptation and that they will be delivered from evil. And of course, we can ensure that they can get hold of Bibles and we can train them 
to use the word of God against those who want to persecute them. These are all things that Open Doors does around the world. And we would love you to join us in this battle to strengthen our brothers and sisters, to help the church stand strong and stand together around the world, to help them defy persecution and to continue to share Jesus no matter the cost. If you'd like to know more about how to join us, you can go to the website www.opendoorsuk.org. We are also running a campaign at the moment, our COVID-19 campaign, to enable us to feed more of our brothers and sisters who are desperately in need of food and basic supplies. In particular, if you feel able to give us a monthly gift, that would be wonderful because it will enable us to walk alongside our brothers and sisters for the long haul. Thank you so much and God bless you.
Thank you so much Henrietta for what you have shared with us. It was so good I just wrote down a few things about the tactics of the enemy that uh, when we're physically and mentally vulnerable he comes and gets at us. When we're isolated and challenged uh, in our identity he really goes at us. And also when he tries to force us to worship other gods and to remove Jesus from our lives. And, and also how the Bible is the response that we have and how <clears throat> it's key to have uh, and use what we know of God's scripture. So that was so helpful. And if you want to support the work of Open Doors, as you saw in that video at the end, you'll see now on the screen is you can go direct to their website and give to support their current uh, campaign they've got to support those around the world during this time. So do please give as you are able. Um, we want to have a, a few... Uh, a chance to share a few words and pictures that might be specifically for you at this time as you are in your home. We believe God speaks today and that these words raise faith that God knows our situation mm -hmm. and he is a God who answers prayer. Uh, and the first thing I, I had as we were maybe just listening to that was of uh, a, a family or someone in a household who feels as if they are being persecuted in some way, either for their faith or for something that's happening and you feel isolated and you feel alone. Uh, and we want to encourage, encourage you, a, a, that God is with you, but B, if you want to talk to someone, um, the office email is on the screen now. Do contact us. We'd love to support you and encourage you at this time if we can help you. So uh, do get in touch. And there's a picture of um, an ostrich with its head uh, stuck in the sand and I think very much uh, what, what Henrietta was speaking to us about is helping us to, to see uh, a much bigger picture. We may feel that in our own individual circumstances we can be locked in those in our own struggles or in things we're finding difficult and it's as if God is saying I want you to lift up your eyes to see me and to be able to see more of what I am doing around the world mm -hmm. and to be aware of the struggles that others are going through as well. So as we finish our time together, I want to pray God's blessing on you, on your family, uh, those with you and maybe those who are not with you. But let's just pause and pray this blessing. Father, thank you that you're a God who knows us and you want to pour out your blessing on us and on your world. And we just pray now that blessing of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Amen. So thanks for joining us for St Andrew's Online today and we hope that you can join us next week. And uh, now we're going to have an opportunity for those of you who wanted to join us for Zoom Coffee. And if you're new and have just started to join us online, new today or been watching with us for the past few weeks, we'd love for you to join us for um, a newcomer's welcome. We'd love to, to get to know who you are and to be able to, to chat with you. So join us. The link will come up and it's also there on the YouTube channel as well. God bless you guys. Yeah, see you next week. Bye.